Um, so we have uh, John, who's going to be presenting today. Uh, John is the principal engineer in the acoustics team at WSP. Uh, having worked for, uh, for WSP in London, John has recently relocated uh, and joined the Auckland team. John has a variety of experience in acoustics, uh, with a primary focus on building acoustics design across a number of sectors, and has previously spent a significant time supporting a number of large UK-based infrastructure projects, including the high-speed uh, two rail link. So, I'm going to pass on the reins to John, and you can take it from here. Great, thanks, Rotis. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Great. Are you going to, um, do you want to cancel, sorry, stop sharing your screen? I can um, take yeah. it over, hopefully. I'm going to just coming up. So, writers, can you yeah just give that back to me as host, and then I'll make John host. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So, John, you should be now the host, and you should be able to control things. Great. Let's have a go. Share the screen. Share some of this. Um, yes. it, is that coming through? Yes, that's coming through just fine. Great. Stick it to the beginning. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, thanks for the introduction, Ritis. As you've um, said, I'm John James. I work for um, WSP um, based in the Auckland office. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk to you about um, acoustics and I suppose some of the interfaces with building services. Um, it's quite common for us to work as, as disciplines together on projects. Um, and so, yeah, some of the, the lessons and I suppose interesting points I've learned over a number of years, it's good to share them with you um, today. Um, as it was highlighted in the introduction there, um, yeah, principal engineer working for WSP out of Auckland. Um, I only moved to Auckland uh, end of last year um, and it was a transfer from WSP in London actually. So um, whilst I know WSP and, and, and sort of how we do things quite well, um, the, the New Zealand market is new to me. Um, but given the way things are with the, um, with the um, pandemic at the moment, as you can see from the photo, recent photo taken in London there, I'm very pleased to be in Auckland, New Zealand, rather than uh, the other side of the world for the time being. Um, a bit about me initially and some of my background. Um, again, as was introduced, um, I spent a lot of the, um, the sort of, uh, it's about five years I was with WSP in the UK before moving over here, and a lot of that was spent on some of the large infrastructure projects um, over there. Uh, most recently, the HS2 um, high speed rail um, link in the UK. I'm not sure if many people are familiar with it or not, but it's um, a pretty big and perhaps controversial project over there. Um, I was involved most recently with the um, Old Oak Common Station, which is one of the large interchange stations in London. Um, the what you can see here in terms of the um, plan, I'm not sure if hopefully the mouse is coming through on the on the screen share. Is you've got a main station um, here with uh, six 400 meter, 450 meter length platforms, um, rail platforms underground here, um, and that's they're contained within a one kilometer underground. Um, underground station box. Um, adjacent to that you've got a number of um, conventional surface uh, platforms as well. Um, and in the middle you have a, a, a large concourse area which um, yeah where, where, where obviously, obviously people come and go and interchange between the stations. Um, it is uh, the HS2 sort of project is a very big project in the in, in the UK as I say when it's complete um, I think let's check my numbers yeah estimated there'll be a quarter of a million people will use um, this station every day um, so it's a, it's a big project in terms of the acoustics um, that we did on it it was is a sort of comprehensive acoustic package we provided um, I'll go through what that might I'll go through what that includes in a bit more detail shortly but um, 
to summarise, we, we looked at all the building services inside and outside of the station and, um, and for a sort of building of this size, that's um, quite significant. Um, a lot of the building structure as well was reviewed acoustically um, and the PA public address um, and voice alarm systems was also a big part of this, ensuring that um, the intelligibility of announcements uh, from, from loudspeakers in this space is, is where it needs to be. <clears throat> Moving on, um, here's, a, here's an, another rail station I did uh, before that, which is London Bridge um, Station Redevelopment. Uh, this was um, it's a good project. This is actually complete and open now. Um, it's, it's, it's quite an impressive space that makes use of the sort of Victorian heritage of the station in, in its design with the, with the arches. Um, and, and there's a much more uh, accessibility and permeability across the station, um, as well as um, much improved acoustic design. Uh, lots of acoustic absorption in, in these sort of architectural finishes and behind them, which again helps um, control the sound um, in that area. <clears throat> Moving on, it's not all rail stations, although um, those, those, those rail stations do take a significant amount of time. In, in terms of the, uh, the, the Old Oak Common Station, we were working on, well, I was working on that for about 12 months per design stage, 12 to 18 months in fact. So the <clears throat> the whole design program is 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 probably seven or eight years for the station and then with the with the construction um, periods on top of that we're sort of looking at a 2030 opening date for that <clears throat> but it's not all it's not all um, big stations here's one of the sort of more interesting projects I left at the end of my time in the UK was um, some boutique cinema designs a chain of them they come with their own acoustic challenges in terms of um, yeah, controlling the and, and improving the noise in, in cinema screens, which are actually uh, built into sort of quite close to some residential properties. And I'm sure you can think around some of the acoustic challenges you might get with them. Um, yeah, high levels of noise and uh, sensitivity, sensitive areas um, next to it. So a quick overview of what I'm hoping to go through for you today. It's not to teach you how to do acoustics. Um, that would be uh, challenging in a sort of 30, 30 minute session, but to give you an understanding of sort, some of the scope of acoustic engineering and what that involves and what I guess specialists in, in the field can help you out with. Um, we'll look to improve the understanding of some of the common terminology, assisting general understanding. I think we'll go through some terms and those of you with experience um, of dealing with um, noise related um, issues there's probably some terminolo terminology you'd be familiar with um, and we can talk about some of the sort of misunderstandings that, that um, come across there and then we'll look at I've got a few on-site considerations which um, are useful which I guess next time you're walking around a construction site if you are then you can look for these potential acoustic issues and understand the the potential impacts and what what you should uh, be looking for and shouldn't be looking for uh, and finally we'll look at celebrating success um, something I think we should all probably do more of um, and just look at a few case studies where um, involvement has, has sort of benefited the design overall so to start, what is acoustic engineering? Um, there's, uh, yeah, a lot of things acoustic engineering could be. Unfortunately, not um, as I guess some people might expect. It's nothing to do with um, music production, um, which whilst it's the, the way a lot of acoustic engineers have potentially got into, um, into the field um, day to day, it's none of that involved, unfortunately. So... Here I've gone through a, a number of different areas of things that we might look at um, just to give you a flavour of some of the things that we do get involved with on a daily basis. So um, building services noise, um, very relevant to building services engineers. Um, uh, equipment can be noisy, obviously um, there's going to be issues with too much noise in sensitive areas and so often looking at acoustic enclosures for um, external equipment or, or any equipment. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's assessments and regulations and um, much we can look at in terms of um, building services noise. Arch architectural acoustics, um, perhaps a bit more flashy, that uh, generally involves the looking at um, the design or the, yeah, the design of um, buildings and rooms, theatres, um, sort of the flashy end. 
um, to make sure that um, sa uh, spaces sound as good as they can. <clears throat> this is a picture of um, the Albert Hall in, in London and there's sort of famously these uh, UF UFO mushroom discs there, um, there for acoustic treatment to help improve the acoustics in the space and um, that's the sort of thing, um, albeit not on a scale of this sort of scale every day, but that's the sort of thing we can look at in terms of some of the architectural acoustics. Okay. Following on from that sound insulation, the um, amount of sound um, that, that transfers through building structures. So uh, <laughs> from this example, if you've got a, a drummer in one side of a house with somebody who doesn't want to hear the drumming in the other side of the house, that's uh, <clears throat> perhaps an extreme example, but something we can look at to, um, we can look at the building structure and predict uh, the level of noise impact that might be realized from um, given activities um, and sensitivities. Uh, PAVA system design, as I sort of touched on in terms of those stations earlier, uh, PAVA is public address and voice alarm system. So it moves into a bit more of the electroacoustic side of things with some sort of um, digital processing and, and loudspeaker technology, but ultimately then uh, ties in with the architectural acoustics um, such that we can um, we can model and use um, computer programs to um, put um, specific loudspeakers in certain spaces and then predict the, um, the performance of them given various architectural features. <clears throat> Environmental assessments and planning, um, we also do a lot of stuff outside. These two examples you can see here are um, considering noise from a, a power station um, and we often go out to sort of rural locations where development is planned and um, do these noise surveys uh, and off the back of those we can establish the existing noise levels at a site um, and consider the suitability of that site for future development. So um, sort of moving along a bit, once, once a development is proposed in a given location we can take a number of noise readings and um, input it into sort of some modelling software as you can see on the right um, an output from that. That helps us predict um, noise levels um, at the facades across across the site and helps us um, consider if a site is going to be suitable for um, for its intended purpose. Uh, demolition construction, another aspect um, ties in with the environmental stuff. Obviously there um, are often very noisy activities and, and it's, it's something we can predict um, and assess and, um, and look to mitigate as well in, in certain circumstances. And um, finally, I think on here, vibration is another um, area we look at both in terms of building services, um, vibration from, from equipment, which is very important inside a building, and also from <coughs> ground-borne vibration from, for example, um, railway lines, particularly underground railway lines uh, in the UK, at least there's a number of those, and you often get a lot of vibration issues um, resulting from that. Again, through, through modelling software, we can model uh, building structures um, and through finite ele uh, element modeling um, we can uh, yeah, predict the level of vibration across the building. <clears throat> Broadly speaking then, um, summarising all of those areas we've just touched on, they can, they can broadly be categorised as environmental acoustics which is the sort of the outside stuff considering um, noise planning for roads um, aircraft, new housing developments and that sort of thing, um, or building acoustics, which again you can subdivide into the architectural um, type of stuff, which is the structures and the room finishes, um, or the building services side of thing, which is um, really where we're going we're gonna to sort of um, park our attention today um, for, for the remainder of the presentation. So <clears throat> why acoustics? A um, number of reasons why um, why use acoustic consultants. So um, we can inform on the relevant regulations and guidance. Um, there is there's there's plenty of it. Um, it's it's always developing as well. So there there's a lot of um, I suppose background reading and knowledge that goes into that. And um, there's there's certain requirements as well which buildings must achieve. So in the, in those um, in those instances, there's statutory requirements which obviously need to be um, designed to, to ensure that um, a, a product or building would be compliant with those. 
Um, further to that, interpreting clients' subjective requirements is, is often a very important one. Um, it's not expected that people know necessarily the, the sort of um, the technical acoustic terms and what they might mean in reality. Um, is is the minimum standards going to be up to their expectations? So understanding a client's requirements, we can um, we can talk through what could or or couldn't be achieved um, given certain parameters and help um, steer um, and manage expectations as well to 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 that end. Um, advising on potential risks an early stage um, is always important and as soon as things can be identified they can be um, they can be challenged or fixed if necessary uh, provide cost effective and practical solutions to challenges um, chances are we've done something similar to it before so um, there's uh, there's always good knowledge to be shared and learned from that um, and yeah improved coordination with the design team which I think we'll touch on a bit at the end of the presentation um, yeah, the, the acoustics is part of design and um, unfortunately for acoustics um, as a discipline generally, we only really notice when a bad job has been um, delivered or provided and the acoustics in a, um, in a, in a given area are, are sort of substandard. Uh, <clears throat> certainly um, through the lockdown period recently, I've noticed there's been a number of um, video calls where <laughs> the acoustics on the call have not been great. You can't understand what um, people are saying in, a, in either a large meeting room or without the sort of proper equipment. Um, hopefully this isn't the case at the moment. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it certainly brings it to the forefront when the acoustics is bad, but um, when they're good, it's not necessarily noticed so much. So to touch on a few fundamentals of acoustics, we won't get too technical or detailed, but um, it's useful to run through a few terms that uh, you commonly see. So sound is measured and reported in decibels, um, dB for short. Um, you often hear people referring to sound and noise as uh, so many dBs, <laughs> um, which, which does often make me laugh when it's um, sort of said slightly out of context or, or not as as it would typically be said but generally that's the parameter which um yeah sound is measured in uh, you can see there the sort of typical range is 0 db to 140 um and yeah that's essentially the threshold of hearing um, moving on a very important distinction to make earlier on is the difference between sound pressure level and sound power level, which those of you who have, um, I suppose worked with a acoustic consultant before might be familiar with. Um, and tie, tying back into the sort of general com comment that something is, is so many dBs, um, actually on its own that doesn't necessarily mean anything and we need to understand what, what we uh, um, what we're actually looking at here. So to, to, to break this down a little bit, sound power level is the sound, um, the total energy um, emitted by an object. Um, yeah, basically the energy contained, the sound energy um, within it, whereas sound pressure level um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a measured pressure level at a certain location um, in a certain environment, as said there. So this would be at, at a set distance from um, a sound source and and in certain conditions for example in sort of outside in a free field environment or in a room be it a small room be it a big room and um, these things actually have an impact on um on the on the measurement or the sound pressure level that you you would measure and so when when you say um something's um so many db um is that is that um at one meter from from the sound source is that 100 meters um, it obviously has a big difference in terms of the impact um, of, of yeah what, what what we're talking about to um, to illustrate that in terms of a sort of um, a heating analogy uh, here we've got um, power from a uh, heat pump on the wall um, the thermal energy uh, within that is is the power rating for the unit and it's a specific unit whereas uh, on the, on the right hand side you've got the temperature there which you'd measure with the thermometer uh, the temperature in the room is dependent on the sort of thermal power of the unit and again the size and materials of the room and um, also the distance uh, from that source um, so that sort of compares directly with um, this acoustic uh, uh, the difference you still have the sound power which is the total energy contained within that specific unit um, and the sound pressure level 
um, is then is dependent on the sound power level, which is your input energy from the unit, but also um, is affected by the size and all the materials of the room, uh, which um, in, in, yeah, in the heating analogy, you might have uh, sort of uh, absorptive materials, absorb heat or reflective materials. You have the same thing with sound. So curtains, soft furnishings, etc., will um, absorb some sound and reduce the sound pressure level, whereas a very um, hard surface room will reflect um, the sound and increase the noise level um, within the room. Uh, noise criteria, noise rating curves, um, NC curves mostly um, over here and these are often used as a sort of criteria. So um, in terms of looking at these NC curves, what they reflect is essentially the sensitivity of um, of human hearing which at lower frequencies and in terms of frequencies we're talking about the the pitch of a sound so low frequency would be um sort of bassy uh low frequency noise whereas high frequency would be um yeah <laughs> higher higher um high pitched sort of sound <clears throat> these 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 contours if you look on this graph um essentially represent um equal uh, sensitivity or equal um, perception of a, a given sound so um, as you move from right to left which is here's high frequency the left is low frequency the the amplitude of this sound has to increase to um, to match a sort of constant um, level of perception so when we are considering criteria acoustic criteria for rooms perhaps in relation to building services um, these uh, these curves are often used as a criteria level, which say I'll take the blue in the middle here, um, NR70 or it could be NC70. Um, this would then become um, the noise the noise target that we're looking to achieve. Um, okay, actually let's <laughs> let's take NR40 as the as the target here. Um, so when when you plot, you take a measurement of, of a sound, you, you come up with a spectrum from low to high frequency of what that um, equipment is, uh, the sound pressure level of, of that in the room. Um, the way the way these work then is the highest um, point on, on that pressure level spectrum um, compared to one of these uh, reference curves is that that is then the sort of uh, the noise rating or the noise criteria curve that it would achieve. So in this example, if we take the red, um, the red uh, dashed line as, as as a measurement, we'd be achieving NR40 um, in in this crate in this in the space or this example. So it's um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of background there about um, NC curves, which you'll often see um, referenced against building services equipment as a, um, um, a noise level. Really, that's that's how you sort of derive and compare. So a, a specific um, dB level is not necessarily comparable to an NC curve. Um, that's the sort of analysis that goes on behind the scenes to to um, to see what what they equate to. Uh, touching on sound pressure levels, um, sound and human ears actually uh, works logarithmically due to the uh, the huge range of um, that the the, uh, the human ear can hear. So, with sound, if you have two identical noise sources, which would be a doubling of sound energy, um, the increase in sound pressure level is only in, well, it's three dB. Um, when you double the number of sources again from two sources to four sources, um, you get. 6 dB increase in um, in sound pressure level. Now, when we're considering um, how the the human perception of this would be, actually doubling of the uh, sound power level, the number of sources, um, gives you a 3 dB increase. But this is actually only just perceptible um, to the human ear. Um, in fact, if we were looking to double the perceived sound, you're actually looking at um, 10 times the number of um, sources or 10 times the sound power level um, which equates to a 10 dB difference in, in, in noise level. Uh, this, this, would be, um, this would be better illustrated with um, a number of uh, sound clips that are embedded but 
Um, I'm not ambitious enough to try them because um, there's just no way they're going to work on a Zoom call. <laughs> um, so understanding how um, the number of sources and the amount of energy um, affects the overall noise level is important, particularly when we're considering uh, the number of noise sources in a, in a building services environment. So for example, if we're talking about um, fans or any noise source, actually the number of fans uh, that we do have, obviously, um, the higher the noise level um, that, we, that we need to consider. So when we are looking at noise impact and assessing the noise from stuff, it would be a cumulative level that we're um, interested in. So um, it's always important to know the number of fans <coughs> that we're looking at. Um, alongside that, uh, it's always important to know the, um, the, 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 the noise the noise data provided for the, the sort of fan in, in, in question should be representative of the intended duty that the fan will operate at um, in its uh, in situ once it's installed. <laughs> there are these, this is an empirical formula which which can be used to an extent which um, predicts the uh, the reduction in noise level as a as a reduction of fan speed. You can see actually for um, perhaps small decreases in speed, you can get a reasonable um, noise reduction. <clears throat> but this is, so, so, so there, is, um, there is some solid theory there and that, that is what happens. But um, generally, if uh, it, it's best assured by um, accurate noise data being received for um, equipment at the, at the specified or the required duty such that um, it, it can be accounted for correctly. Uh, finally, it doesn't doesn't flow too much, but an, another interesting and um, important differentiation to make for acoustics is the difference between sound insulation and sound absorption. Um, they are both types of treatment that um, are often used, but um, are very different and often um, often misunderstood or or misused. So um, this this applies to um, for example, a building in terms of the, the noise transfer through a building or in a room as well. But for this example, um, just looking at um, noise in ductwork. So uh, you can, and I'm sure you're familiar with um, either externally lagged ductwork or internally lined ductwork. Um, these can be done, well, externally could be done for thermal reasons, but just looking at the acoustics reasons here, um, externally lagging ductwork and usually although not shown here you'd have a <laughs> perhaps a polymeric mass barrier um, on the outside of the duct uh, lagging on the outside of the duct is for insulation um, or isolation of the sound so <laughs> having additional mass um, in the in the outer barrier or, or inner material um, helps contain the noise um, within the duct and this could be for example a wall in a building but sticking with the duct and that um, example here helps con uh, contain the noise within the duct which um, <coughs> which um, yeah which obviously uh, protects any um, environment outside of the duct uh, from the noise so if you've got a sensitive area uh, you don't want noise this ducts running over the top of um, an office area for example externally lined duct will help um, contain the noise within the duct and protect it from um, breaking out to uh, yeah to a sensitive area below for example <clears throat> looking at the internally lined duct um, which yeah shouldn't shouldn't be um, they shouldn't be mixed up actually this uh, doesn't have much impact uh, lining with a sort of absorptive uh, rock wall type product um, on the internal side of the duct doesn't have much impact in terms of the noise breakout from the duct so if you had um, if you had a, a noise sensitive location below, actually lining inside or not would likely result in a similar noise level at this location. But the benefit that this does provide is um, attenuation down the duct. So um, as noise transfers uh, down the duct, uh, this absorption on the inside is going to um, slowly absorb the sound and reduce it as you um, propagate uh, down uh, from left to right, say. So um, a little bit on noise data here. This is again ties in with um, a common 
a common uh, thing that we we have to deal with and it's it's sort of good and bad data essentially so taking a fan core unit as um as an example there's two di <coughs> diagrammatically here there's two sort of main noise sources that we'd look to consider one would be a combination of the inlet and uh, casing radiated noise and one very separately would be the um sort of the supply point at the end of the um ductwork wherever it's supply in the room uh, and ideally we well we need to consider these to consider these accurately we need to know that they're going to be very different then they they might be related but they're not going to be the same and so we need to um, we need to have data which represents each of these independently <clears throat> looking here at a, a sort of testing setup the way to do this would be to um, install a fan cool unit in one room uh, calibrated rooms in a test test laboratory measure the noise level in this in this space you'll get the casing uh, inlet and the casing breakout noise also to measure um, then at the sort of termination point you get the noise level from uh, from the outlet from that you can derive um, some sort of sound power levels for each of those which is great and that's exactly what we're looking for when we um, take information from uh, mechanical services, building services engineers and and work through an acoustic assessment on that basis. However, uh, what we also get is um, this type of data which <coughs> diagrammatically here you have a unit with two meters of duct um, installed on either end. Uh, this is the measurement location 1.5 meters below it uh, and you get then as shown here different units, different duties but basically a single number which is um, which consists of a contribution from uh, noise out of each duct um, but only to two meters length um, and noise uh, from the casing radiates uh, yeah radiated from the casing at the same time from this actually um, it's very difficult to uh, work back to get um, uh, levels which you'd like to use based on a sort of typically installed situation it's, it's unlikely in reality you'd have a situation whereby the unit set up like this often the ducts would be longer ducted to another room perhaps um, and so working as per the original example with um, with with better raw data is is much preferable um, preferable from an acoustic consultant's point of view um, just looking at the bottom here and I suppose to labor the difference um, in terms of dbs again uh, here we've got a uh, octave band spectrum which is the frequency noise data from 125 to 4 kilohertz um, but just looking at the, the broadband uh, <coughs> level which is uh, dba a weighted i won't touch on that too much today but it's it's to do again with the sensitivity of um, human hearing and how these you know, how these levels as a sort of broadband level are perceived but um, for an equivalent unit here we've got a sound pressure level of 40 and a sound power level of 59 so um, it, it, it sort of hits home the importance of understanding what um, what sort of noise data and what conditions uh, the the data is measured and what it's presenting because if you take one to be the other obviously you can be um, you could be significant significantly out with um, with any predictions so um, on-site considerations uh, there's a quite a big list there of there's loads of things um, that we'd look at. Um, I'll give you a second to look through those. I don't pretend, uh, don't intend to go through all of those. But um, what we do have is a number of um, images just to demonstrate some of the good and the bad things that we might see on site. That um, if, for example, you had been involved in a building services design and you were doing a, a site walk around and um, you notice these these not necessarily uh, good in terms of the acoustic design and I'll also point out this is just in terms of acoustic design it's not in terms of cabling and other things um, which may be good or bad but um, yeah not 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 my place to comment today so on the left we've got services penetration here with a duct with a clearly you can see through the whole um, this is bad in terms of the acoustics any noise you've got in one room is going to readily transfer into the other room and that's that's not what we um it's going to undermine the performance of uh this wall um and uh yeah be, be pretty bad in terms of noise noise um, disturbance between the two spaces much better 
for this duct, not actually for this um, this cabling, but for the duct is to have a proper detail across um, this area which fully seals it. Um, and that's going to give you a much better um, sound insulation performance between between those two spaces. Now there's a few slides here which are spot the difference. Um, so it's um, yeah not a very interactive session unfortunately, but I'll give you a second to have a look through those um, and see if you can spot the issues in terms of the acoustics with um, with these images. And not, not to dwell on it too long, but again, cable tray here, um, you can see light straight through there. That's going to be bad acoustically. If you've got noise in, say, a plant room here, it's going to transfer straight out of there very easily. Um, but yeah, unsealed penetration, that's, that's, that's going to be bad. Uh, looking at the others, again, you've got the same, you've got the same details, really. The, if you've got a cable tray um, going through here, it needs to be... Uh, it needs to be filled and sealed up better to maintain the acoustic um, integrity of a partition. Um, we don't want to see daylight um, or have big holes through walls um, if, there's a, if there's a requirement for privacy or acoustic separation between, um, between those spaces. A couple more to have a look at here. What you can see, uh, <laughs> I don't actually know what this is. This is terrible coordination. Um, yeah, there's a ductwork coming through basically two walls. Um, there's lots of weaknesses around there. That's not that's not great coordination. And also here, um, this this uh, cable hole hasn't been um, uh, well, yeah, fully fully filled, which it should be, and sealed, um, and it's far bigger than the cabling. Uh, so that that needs to be sealed up um, retrospectively, really, to maintain the acoustic integrity there. Um, on the right hand side, uh, we've got flexible acoustic ducts, oh, sorry, or flexible ducts at least here. Uh, the trouble we have with, uh, with flexible ducts penetrating acoustically rated partition is that this sort of, um, this sort of uh, duct is not very good at insulating. Um, if we go back to the, think back to the, the two images about the sound insulation and the sound absorption, the sound insulation of this is very poor, so noise, noise can, um, easily transfer in and back out of this ductwork so whilst we might have a solid wall here which is um, which is fit for purpose actually if we've got flexi duct penetrating through it like this um, you're quite likely to get noise breaking into the um, into the duct transferring through the partition and um, breaking out again on the other side uh, this is um, yeah possibly the last one but um, again uh, what are we looking at? Yeah, poor ceiling. Uh, these, uh, the sort of the framing around this is is the right idea, and we and we would look to in, introduce patris boards around services to help provide some mass and protect um, the edge detailing around there. But yeah, clearly this is this has got big gaps in. Um, it's not a good example. Uh, and again, here you've got the boards in place, but it's not sealed around the. Um, the central area as well. <clears throat> Finally, some, some good examples. Um, well sealed, uh, fully sealed um, penetrations. This is this is the sort of thing that we'd be looking for on site um, if, if we were checking this out. <clears throat> so um, attenuators and ductwork layout. So a little bit on sound attenuators this is a uh, very mechanical based um, I'm afraid for um, other other specialists but um, it's probably where the largest interface between acoustic consultants and mechanical consultants is generally um, sound attenuators I'm sure um, many are familiar with um, basically reduce uh, noise in a, in a duct as, as it travels down the ductwork and they do so with um, restricted airways um, and absorptive um, passageways so in between these uh, behind the steelwork there's a, um, a whole load of acoustic absorption uh, that absorbs the sound as it passes through these airways um, which are quite restrictive um, and the time it comes out at the other end it's been absorbed uh, well a proportion of it has been absorbed um, within the attenuator. 
the attenuators do increase uh, they do add resistance to a, a, a sort of ventilation system that's something that should be considered when selecting fans um, to account for the pressure drop that will be um, provided or added as a result of these attenuators typically a sort of rule of thumb guidance would be to limit the pressure drop on attenuator to 50 pascals um, this limits the impact of regenerated noise uh, regenerated noise is basically the whistling sound you get um, if you can consider an example where you've got um, perhaps a small grill with a high flow of air coming through it and uh, maybe something restrictive in the airway um, it's the sort of whistling sound you get as um, air moves at high velocity through um, yeah, a small passageway essentially <clears throat> something to consider in terms of the placing of attenuators in a system um, and this is ties in with sort of manufacturer literature and data for them as well. The, uh, the data that is provided, including pressure drop data, is all based on, um, well, it would be called typical um, installation scenarios. But this is basically where the attenuator is, um, is open to a laminar flow of air um, in essentially a straight duct with no obstacles um, in the way if you look at these two examples you've got down here on the right um, on the left hand side the attenuator is located very closely to the fan which is often done due to space issue, spatial sort of constraints and issues but actually it's not an ideal um, setup in terms of uh, the, the airflow and air coming off the fan will still be very turbulent before it goes into the attenuator and this will increase and um, this will significantly increase the the pressure drop across it um, more ideally as shown on the right, you would have a, a longer transi uh, transition section such that you do get this laminar thread flow across um, the full face of the attenuator. A couple more examples on there um, at the top here with a circular, um, a circular axial fan and attenuators with a central circular pod. You don't, <laughs> clearly in this example, you don't want the pod to be um, fitted directly to the fan. Uh, this is going to obstruct. Um, airflow and again not leave you with the laminar flow which is what you really want um, across the attenuator to get the to get the um, the published performance uh, again looking at the bottom here there's two two things to consider in this example the centrifugal fan um, if it was installed as shown on the left you're going to get the majority of the airflow uh, passing through the top airway only um, rather than through each of the airways so uh, it, okay, two two things to note. One, this transition section, this uh, this allows the air to settle down, so it does see across uh, move across the full face of the attenuator. But also um, on the right, you've got a vertical splitter in the middle here. On the left, these are actually shown horizontally. So again, it helps with the vertical splitters in this sort of arrangement. It helps with the um, even flow of air across the full face, rather than encouraging um, all the air through one of the, uh, the passageways, which is gonna, um, it's gonna give you more regenerated noise and a higher resistance across, uh, across that. <clears throat> same thing with, it's not just attenuators, but same thing with grills, essentially. It's always good to have a plenum space between um, attenuators and or grills, diffusers, um, basically for the same reasons as we touched on with the attenuators. There's a bit of data there. It's I suppose to say um, there are um, there are correction factors we can apply. So if we know ideally these things would be avoided um, for optimal performance and minimum resistance to the system, but there are correction factors. If we know what the setup is, we can we can look at it um, and consider what the impact might be um, and it can be factored in. Um, again, with um, fan selection and, and, and suitable um, power for the fan. Uh, this ties in with um, regenerated noise here in terms of ductwork layouts. Um, smooth, um, smooth transitions really are best um, for acoustics. They're obviously best um, mechanically generally as well. But um, I suppose the thing to note is where we do have um, abrupt changes of direction in ductwork. Um, this does generate noise which which we need to consider so where we have mostly on the right hand side smoother transitions this is the best solution acoustically where we have these options on the left um, the turbulent air generated as a result of sort of um, 
yeah, significant change in either direction or, or shape. Um, that is going to is going to create turbulence in the airflow, which will which will generate noise, and it's also potentially going to um, uh, impart energy into the ductwork, which again will radiate there and and sort of rumble away, which is which is not ideal. <clears throat> Table here just to summarise again when we know um, when we know what systems we're looking at, we can advise as acoustic consultants on sort of maximum recommended air velocities. Uh, the table here we're looking at is this is the acoustic criteria per column for say typical 30 35 40 43 45 dba um, acoustic criteria um, that translates into sort of maximum um, advisable uh, flow rates for different um, areas of, um, of ventilation system so that's something we can look at and consider and advise on in in a design <clears throat> Crosstalk attenuators and ductwork layout um, is an interesting one and certainly in the last sort of six months working in New Zealand this is something I've seen come up a lot that hasn't been necessarily considered um, properly. <clears throat> so there's two things to, a few things to talk about here. Um, speed of sound is roughly 340 meters per second say the maximum velocity of air in a duct is 10 meters per second, this has very little effect on the, uh, the overall or the net uh, speed of sound, whether it's traveling um, up or down uh, the stream in terms of the, in terms of the flow rate. So, um, so it should be considered that noise can travel um, and does travel uh, both ways in a duct, not just in the direction of, um, of the airflow. Now, Crosstalk attenuation or attenuators, you may or may not be aware, are essentially introduced where you have two rooms which are served by a common system as sort of shown um, in this section. Uh, what you can have is um, say a meeting room with a number of people talking, a common duct ductwork to another area and you, you get a lack of privacy um, as a result of this sort of arrangement here. So um, introducing a crosstalk attenuator in the middle there just means that any any noise that does break into the duct is attenuated um, and shut down there. Um, in terms of the arrangement of this, looking at it on the right hand side, um, it's best to have these crosstalk attenuators generally um, in a parallel sort of series as shown here rather than um, series here. If you do have the series approach you get a lot of um, resistance or pressure as a result of each attenuator um, adding up in the system. Whereas you have this in parallel, this is, isn't the case in this example. Um, to add to this, um, this arrangement, which I've seen a lot recently as well, uh, means that ductwork passes over each of the meeting rooms and does present you with this exact scenario on the left-hand side um, and has to penetrate um, the, uh, the walls, if you like, between each meeting room. Um, so that again presents another um, acoustic weakness in terms of sound transfer through that penetration. So when you when you um, have this sort of arrangement as shown as the bottom here, uh, you only have one penetration through the front wall of a meeting room, which is generally less sensitive than the side walls and um, has a door in it, which are also less um, good performing acoustically. Um, that's that's the best sort of arrangement you can look for. Really, uh, mechanical equipment. This is noisy generally, and something we're we're um, we're often considering and dealing with. Uh, the only barrier between the equipment and the occupants is the ceiling. If we're lucky, uh, it's increasingly common for exposed services. These are very noisy and very difficult to treat, um, and so can present a lot of um, challenges acoustically. Um, and it's something we really need to look at um, and consider uh, the placement of units is um, is important and this is something that can help reduce noise levels without actually introducing any um, particular cost or, or or mitigation to a to a, to a scheme so taking this um, this example here uh, or the, and, and a comparison of the two we've got a meeting room on the left with a corridor on the right if we put the fan core unit um, in the meeting room We've got the two contributions of, of noise, which we touched on before, which is the sort of sound duct supply noise and also the casing or in, and inlet um, breakout noise level. Uh, here you've got a contribution of the two, 
um, in the meeting room. If you if you switch the arrangement to something like we do have on the right, actually, then with with the fan core unit out of the room, uh, one you have a less sensitive corridor and potentially a plasterboard ceiling, um, which which isn't penetrated with the ductwork in. Um, this then splits up the noise sources, so uh, so it can be um, more achievable to um, to hit the, the noise targets in these areas. And um, furthermore, with the the increased uh, length of ducts, this could potentially be lined. Um, there's more scope for introducing um, attenuators if needs be, or, or just acoustic lining um, to make sure that this um, internal noise level in the meeting room, which would be considered a sensitive space, can be achieved. A <clears throat> little bit on equipment vibration, how are we doing for time? A um, couple of slides on this, I think. Vibration is important um, acoustically, and once uh, any sort of building services equipment um, vibrates and that energy gets into the structure of the building it can be very hard to mitigate and predict um, and can be very annoying as, as, as the sound sort of re-radiates elsewhere in the building as, um, as re-radiated noise um, from, from the equipment so everything so as, as, a, um, as a sort of rule of thumb any equipment should be fitted with um, with some sort of anti-vibration treatment essentially particularly if it's um, in a sensitive area uh, it's not just the equipment itself we need to consider though but I think if we click through it's also everything that's connected to the equipment so here if you've got pipe work um, or duct work um, connected to um, a fan this is also going to be um, sort of moving with the uh, with the equipment and any vibration levels that might be in those um, that needs to be controlled as well. Uh, a few typical isolators which we can look at installing, which are um, probably familiar to um, to you. So uh, elastomeric area pads, um, neoprene turrets, these are pretty basic and uh, often, often used to mount equipment on. These are good at um, some high frequency absorption. They're not necessarily very intrusive in, or costly um, and they do and they do provide a degree of isolation, which is um, which is great. And they can come in sort of, they can be used in hanger forms uh, as restrained turrets um, or just pads um, themselves. Moving on from pads um, is, is sort of spring isolation, which is the next step up generally and is better performing, particularly at low frequency. The to get the best out of a uh, vibration isolation, the, the the isolator needs to be loaded. Um, and so we talk about the static um, displacement of um, a spring, for example, is, is a measure of its performance. So um, this is, of course, we, the spring can't be designed to bottom out. If you, if you put a very heavy weight on a, on a spring, um, it's going to squash, it's going to bottom out, it's going to do nothing. So it needs to be designed such that given the, given the load, the dynamic load and forces that it's going to be um, operating against, um, the greater the static deflection of the spring, um, the better the isolation efficiency. So um, that is, uh, that's what we're looking for essentially with when selecting um, springs on equipment is, is to load them to the, 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 the best possible place without um, bottoming them out. To, to improve that further on some equipment, you can mount it on an inertia base, particularly pumps. Uh, inertia bases have the benefit of adding a lot of mass, which um, which um, ties in with my last point about loading the springs to a certain point helps and um, helps uh, compress the springs and improve the um, the isolation efficiency. Um, it also has the benefit of lowering the center of gravity of a moving bit of equipment. So um, yeah, the forces that are then inserted or transferred into the structure are, are reduced. A few extra points, yeah, flexible pipe bellows, flexible in, um, in inverted commas there. Um, they are flexible and they are there to help deal with um, uh, displacement between pipe work and pumps, for example. But um, in terms of acoustics, actually, certainly under high pressures, the fluid um, within the system uh, can trans transfer um, vibrations as if it was a solid essentially. So whilst these um, these do um, help with any alignments in the system and any movement in that respect, actually vibration can still get passed straight through these systems, uh, which is why 
um, a certain amount of pipe work um, would often need to be hung on spring hangers or, or neoprene hangers um, as well. <clears throat> Design team collaboration. So just a few points, I suppose, a bit of food for thought. Um, how can we help you and your clients as an acoustic consultant? Uh, be aware of the project acoustic requirements. There are, there are requirements, um, lots of um, planning requirements, uh, building code, etc., that um, requires um, certain um, acoustic things, and so it's important to be um, aware of what those issues are. Um, think about noise early in the design and identify potential risk areas. Uh, yeah, it's important to identify these things as early as possible. Um, that way, uh, they can be considered and. Uh, sort of mitigation approaches can be um, can be done. Uh, um, watch out for acoustic pitfalls. We've been through a few of these today. Um, be careful of them, and if they come up, uh, yeah, watch out for them. And engage your acoustic consultant early in the design process to maximise design integration and coordination. Um, yeah, as we said, we've we've done a lot of these things before, so often there are solutions there, and the sooner we can be involved, um, we can inter uh, integrate solutions and coordinate them, and often that that ends up in the best, uh, least intrusive um, design solutions. Um, and remembering that poor acoustics can undermine good design intent. So, generally, whilst the design might um, be um, very well performing if in fact it's actually very noisy and um, the whole the whole design isn't going to be seen in a good light and remedial acoustic treatment measures can be expensive it's, it's, and intrusive it's difficult to um, it's difficult to mitigate things uh, or it's easiest rather to um, do it um, at the design stage <clears throat> celebrating success a um, couple of quick case studies then just to highlight the success. So time back to the, um, well, the HS2 project I mentioned at the beginning. <clears throat> this, isn't, <laughs> this obviously isn't a railway station. Um, I didn't have a site or project photo, but um, there was a number of jet fans in the underground platform. There's a number of jet fans um, which um, propel air at high velocity um, installed at the um, entrances to the underground tunnels at the edge of the platforms uh, the point of them being as as trains entered the um, entered the station area out of the out of the tunnels and um, they brought with them a lot of heat that heat didn't uh, the station doesn't want to have to deal with that amount of heat so these jet fans um, blow air um, against the direction of travel um, to stop that heat from blowing into the uh, into the, uh, the the platform area um, and there's also a sort of a natural ventilation and opening to outside so that the hot air could rise and dissipate. These fans are very noisy um, and there's not much you can do to attenuate them or make them quieter essentially. So in this example, we were able to consider the noise impact, which even with the maximum mitigation that could reasonably achieved was over the, um, the design requirements for the noise level on the platform area. However, we will be able to, we were able to interrogate that a bit further and through understanding the, um, the extent of the um, exceedance in criteria and uh, both in terms of um, increased level, but also the, uh, the extent in terms of the plan area on the platforms that was affected, um, we were able to agree a relaxation and actually agree that these, these, these fans were acceptable because um, the, the principal um, requirements, uh, the drivers for the acoustic um, criteria, which was predominantly the intelligibility of the, um, again, the public address and voice alarm systems, um, that was not impaired. Uh, another one here, sorry, they're all um, UK um, based projects, unfortunately for me. This is the um, Fulham Football Club Riverside Stand development, which is underway at the moment. It's, um, it's a football pitch here on the uh, behind this stand but this stand is going to be developed into a number of hotels and hospitality and um, public realm area at the bottom uh, suffice to say the mechanical um, designer on this project had introduced a um, a whole host of um, 
sound attenuators, hundreds and hundreds of them across all the systems, basically playing it safe, uh, safe essentially. So we, <clears throat> we were able to um, look through the design, run through a number of calculations, and actually um, there's a whole load of um, attenuators which could be removed from the design, um, obviously with a cost saving um, as a result of the, the, the acoustic analysis. So finally, to summarize what we've been through to date, um, introduced acoustic engineering and um, what, that, what that typically entails. Um, we've looked at a few acoustic parameters and terminology, which hopefully we've uh, shared um, some insight into what the difference between them. Uh, <clears throat> we've explored some on-site issues and typical things to look good and the bad to, to look out for on there. Um, highlighted, touched on how we could best work together and the importance of getting involved and also celebrated success through um, a number of case studies. That's the end. Um, yeah. So, so <clears throat> John, thanks for that. Can you just transfer the host to Ritis? Is that possible? That'd be good. Yeah, let me have he a can, go. He can handle some questions. Sure. How is that? Right. Hi everybody. Um, yeah. Um, is anyone in the audience has got any questions? If you do, please uh, write those in the in the uh, Q and A, um, and we can see if uh, John can answer these. So. So writers have just noticed it seems to be a bit difficult to, I can't seem to write a, um, a, a question in the Q&A, so somebody's used the chat at the moment. Okay, right, I'll check the chat out. Sorry. Yeah, I've seen, I can see it coming here, so. Um... <clears throat> so for, uh, for a really heavy equipment and large uh, like generators, what would a vibration control uh, solution look like? Yeah, okay, I can talk about this. There's a project actually I've got um, running, working with at the moment, and there is uh, generators, emergency generators and some large chillers as well, actually, which are um, are to be located on the rooftop of, um, of the building. Um, so firstly, um, sort of prevention is always better than mitigation where possible. So firstly, it's always worth exploring if there are alternative locations available for this equipment, um, if you've got a sensitive area, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in, in this, in my current example, we do, um, it's not ideal. And if there are alternative options, it should seriously be considered. Nonetheless, um, there are reasons sometimes why it would go there. So um, for a generator, for example, you'd have a, a, a fairly sizable floating slab um, underneath it. Uh, this would be, basically inertia base as I touched on in one of the earlier slides there. Um, the, um, that would give you um, a good, um, good weight. The generator would also be very heavy, but then that would be um, fitted with um, potentially spring, well, probably springs. Um, you could even get air springs if you needed even greater performance. They, they, they perform down to a lower frequency. It depends on the sensitivity of, and, and the structure as well of a building. Um, but for vibration, you'd be would be looking at um, that type of arrangement essentially. Um, it's also worth noting with the generators, they are very noisy. It not so it's not just the vibration always that you're you're concerned with. It is it is the airborne noise from them as well. So I would expect certainly in a sensitive area that there would be a full enclosure, acoustic enclosure around a generator, which would be a sort of some sort of solid structure. Um, the, the airways would be attenuated with large um, attenuators, again, as we touched on in, in the in presentation. And they would probably be 1,500 to metres even in length um, to give you um, a, a good deal of attenuation from, from that. Um, to, to add to that further as well, I know in the, in the example I'm working on currently, we've also got a, um, a mass barrier ceiling on the underside of the structural slab. Um, to improve uh, the yeah the works for airborne sound insulation essentially so 
um, in terms of noise control, we're looking at the generator mounted on a floating slab, 200 mil thickness in my current example on springs mounted on the structural deck with a, um, a mass barrier ceiling suspended on springs on the underside of uh, the, the structural slab as well. Awesome. Um, so in your experience, uh, have you found any major manufacturers of noise data uh, for the pain core units so it's been accurate against the published data? So I guess it's a name and shame. Hmm. Uh, I, you know, I, don't, I don't want to name and shame. And some are better than others in terms of, so there's two parts I suppose to that question. Some are better than others in terms of providing the data that as, as acoustic engineers we can use. Um, the data though, and this, this is an important thing as well, actually another point here is the data is not reflective of um, an installed situation. So taking it back to that sound pressure level an analogy at the beginning, um, the sound pressure level is affected by um, the environment, the room, the conditions, the sort of distance you are away from a, um, a sound source. So the, that, that's different on a case by case basis. So a manufacturer, um, obviously can't predict well they, they, they could if they knew and they had a good understanding of the project but in terms of generalized literature they can't predict that level so um, it's not actually you, you wouldn't necessarily compare an in situ measured level against the lit, the, the, um, the, the literature um, but you would take the literature and run some some further processing or calculations on it to to um, predict the level on a project specific basis sure. Um, there was a, a mention of uh, max fit EPA uh, through attenuator. Uh, how important is the velocity through the attenuator? Uh, so acoustically, it's not important necessarily, but it is more of a mechanical consideration, really. So the, the trade-off with attenuators is um, two things to consider. There's the percentage-free area in the cross-section of an attenuator. So the um, the lower the free area, um, the better the acoustic performance. That, that's to say, if you have smaller and smaller airways, um, proportionally the, the, the air and sound has to travel um, through and, and see more acoustic absorption. However, the flip side of that is the, the obviously the, the passage velocity of the air in the airways for the attenuators increases and that increases the, um, the, the resistance of um, caused by the attenuator in the, in the ventilation system. So there, there is a trade-off between acoustic performance and pressure drop there. Um, the other thing to consider is the length of the attenuator. Again, increasing the length of an attenuator, you get longer airways, you get more absorption, acoustic absorption in those, in those channels. And that again, increases the performance of the attenuator. That doesn't have so much an effect on the, on the pressure drop, but there's, there's a trade-off there to be, um, to be considered really. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it comes down to fan selection and there's perhaps or can be an iterative process there that if a fan is selected at its maximum, um, the system is designed for a certain total resistance and you add, add at the last, you add late in the design an attenuator with a certain amount of resistance to it, um, obviously you need to make sure that the fan is capable of, of, of dealing with that. Um, there's uh, one more question. Uh, so. Um, when uh, thinking of the metal ce uh, ceilings and walls, uh, can you please describe the effect on the metal being uh, perforated? Uh, will, the, uh, will this have any impact uh, on the RW of the system? Uh, yep. And will it uh, uh, purely affect the uh, absorption? Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, this this is this is ties into the um, the sound insulation or the sound absorption sort of thing we touched on in the presentation actually. So a perforated ceiling tile, say, um, is perforated such that the, um, the typically the absorptive material behind the perforations um, is is exposed to the sound, say, um, in a room, um, and it can therefore provide the the it can do the absorption. Um, the perforations are just there really to hold hold obviously the, the material in place and give it a rigid um, rigid front backing. Um, but if yeah if if they are perforated, then it's going to have next to no um, sound insulation performance. So um, 
this is where you would have, if you have a ceiling tile, say a metal ceiling tile with a perforated face and some absorption behind it, that's going to give you very little sound insulation, um, but very good sound absorption. Uh, the flip side of that or the sort of opposite would be, say, a plasterboard ceiling is going to have very good sound insulation, but very bad or no next to no sound absorption um, just with the hard reflective surface. So, um yeah, if if the uh, if the metal is perforated, it will. Well, I'm, I, I don't want to say it would reduce the sound absorption because you should be using whatever sound absorption it is should be reflective of using that sound uh, that um, that product. But um, I wouldn't expect a perforated um, product to provide any or any significant um, sound insulation performance. Which the RW of a system RW is is a measure of um, the sound reduction between two spaces through a product so um, equivalent to the STC rating which which we use in New Zealand um, yeah does that answer the question um, yeah, so this has been a follow-up question so um, I think so um, got another one um, for internal line duct do you consider uh, the increase uh, increase the year velocity due to the increase of the free uh, or due to decrease of the free area for example, so 300 by 300 uh, duct with a 50 mil uh, lining would have a free area of 250 by 250. So, yeah, uh, not really in terms of the acoustic design, I suppose. Um, I think that would probably be um, one for the um, the mechanical um, engineer to to consider. Um, I might be proved wrong with a sort of worked example, but my initial thoughts would be um, the face velocity wouldn't increase too significantly. Um, and so if it was, um, yeah, it's unlikely to be the difference between um, totally fine and totally wrong, essentially. Um, but in terms of the noise, uh, acoustically, there would be no difference to it. We would get the we'd get the um, acoustic benefit we're look, looking for through, from the in, internally lined ductwork. Um, and yeah, there wouldn't be, we'd only be looking at regenerated noise as a result of the increased um, flow rate, which um, I don't think would be um, changed significantly. Cool. Um, got a question as well. Um, have you dealt with introducing noise? Because we're talking about uh, removing noise now, um, but introducing the background noise, um, similar to let's say in the lobbies or anything to reduce the uh, kind of the, yeah. the eerie quietness. Yeah, so sound masking systems is probably what you were talking about there really. And they involve basically um, a series of loudspeakers fitted in the ceiling uh, voids generally, um, actually pointing up at the at the soffit above um, to give as diffuse a sound as possible when it reflects off the ceiling um, to the um, to the area below the, the point of them is essentially is, is a masking system so <clears throat> when when for example we're considering um, disturbance from one room to another and um, the, the, the factors that we consider are the the level of source noise of somebody talking uh, the amount it's reduced by um, from a partition and then the the level is in the receiving room now if it, if if there's a um it'd be easier to perhaps draw something but um if there is a constant level of um, noise in a room uh then yeah that's going to mask anything that falls below it so um yeah the, the they are used however in my experience they um and they actually they can be used very effectively particularly in um, hospital wards is is somewhere where people need to sleep and recover in the rooms they get used but um in every example i've ever sort of come close to using them they they do get value engineered out um but they can work they can work quite effectively it's a very um they used a lot in america um quite effectively as well was there um i sort of talked around it there was there a specific question i'm sorry i've missed them um, oh just uh, just knew i'd have to touch base on it um honestly um yeah um right just checking out 
Um, yeah, there's no other questions. So um, I guess, yeah, thank you, John. Um, thanks for letting us into your world of acoustics um, and what to look out for and what to um, do and not do. Um, yeah. I, I, so I, I hope that it's everybody had as well a um, good, uh, good understanding of um, what to ask an acoustic engineer or when to come see it, uh, see one. Um, but yeah. Um, I'll just say finally, you've got, you've got obviously my email address is on the screen there. So if you do have any other questions or would like to know anything um, more about what I've said or would like to know, or have another acoustic question that um, comes to mind, obviously take a note of it. I'll be um, happy to um, to give you a call or speak to you or um, talk through anything should it come up. Um, always happy to do so. Cool. Uh, thank you. Um, now, for those who are still online, uh, there will be a recording of the, uh, this acoustics um, uh, webinar. Uh, it will be on the SIBSI website, um, so feel free to um, jump in there and watch it again if you need to, if you want to rewind and yeah, um, cool. I think we'll stop it here. Uh, so thank you, thank you for everybody for attending um, yeah, and hopefully we'll see you in um, the next uh, webinars or in person uh, for the CPDs around place. Cool. Thank you.